Okay, so uh, this is our last meeting. I'm grateful to all of you for showing up, uh, even though people could be here, there, and elsewhere. Um, uh, and uh, what I thought, I uh, I'd like to at least begin by making a couple of my own comments, not necessarily on the paper that I hope some of you have read. Um, uh, some of you did actually did refer to it, uh, but I uh, will make a couple of uh, respond to that if you uh, if you ask me. But I did want to um, make a couple of comments about um, the task of uh, teaching Hasidism, not just in this context, but in the context of the university. Um, so at least you get a kind of personal uh, a teacher's perspective, but also. Um, a, a very particular, my own perspective, and, and um, before we go to personal responses, I'll be happy to respond to people's um, thoughts about this or their questions. So obviously when a teacher tries to figure how do you present a social and historical, but particularly an intensely religious phenomenon, um, in a university context, what kind of choices do you make? And what kinds of ways does a teacher have to think about doing this differently than if you're teaching this in a private study group or in a religious context uh, or in a place where either everybody is um, religiously committed to it or everybody is not religiously committed to it but in a context like this where there are a variety of ages a variety of intellectual backgrounds a variety of cultural backgrounds uh, and a variety of now uh, there's a religious diversity uh, as well of uh, people coming from various religious backgrounds so I had to think about all of that as to what would be an approach. And obviously when I was first thinking about the class, uh, I was intending this to be face-to-face. -face. And I know that Yitz um, uh, Goldstein referred to that in his response paper. We'll pick up on that as well. Um, teaching face-to-face, -face, of course, is extremely important in all cases, but particularly in the context of a subject like this, because for a teacher, it's very important to see not only the face, but people's eyes, their body movement. Um, and also it's uh, easier to zero in more directly on personal questions, because I think people begin to develop a little bit of a rapport by feeling your friends' bodies and body spaces, um, that you can, uh, we can turn to each other and, um, uh, as we would be going, if I was doing this, obviously in a face-to-face -face class, in many cases, I probably could have pulled back and talked about my personal response to the text. Obviously, the first issue is my responsibility to the subject matter and my responsibility as a teacher to conveying some aspect of the subject matter. But what it was harder to do in this context because we're all so frontal and I'm seeing you on a gallery, is to um, bring you into more personal reactions to the text, which I would have done um, on a particular basis. And I had to, in these cases, do it more indirectly. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, nevertheless, uh, we were faced with this particular situation and then this also made it a little bit more um, formalized than a subject like this. Um, I would have liked it had been even within a university context. So first, let me at least say, um, in term, before I tell you about the method I decided to choose, what I decided not to do, right? Uh, which is essential, in a sense, for understanding what Hasidism is in the broadest sense. And in some ways, I try to um, handle that by either choosing Elior's book or making certain kind of references, but obviously that's not going to be complete. So one of the things that I could only allude to, and if that interests you, you have to follow that up, 
was to talk about the whole social historical background of Hasidism. That is to say, how does Hasidism continue and vary the terms of medieval Kabbalah or 16th century Kabbalah in Sfat? Or even more particularly, um, how is its language and even some of its most daring formulations related to the so-called Musar movement the, um, uh, that was developing also in the 16th and 17th century, not the, not the latest Musar movement, but there were trends already um, uh, much earlier, even in, uh, in, in Franco-Germany. Uh, and then, of course, how this is related to the whole Sabbatean movement in terms of certain continuities, certain kind of formulations. So that was, uh, if you read parts of Elior, you could have seen some of that. You could follow up the bibliography if you're interested in social movements. When I was a student your age, um, the whole issue of Marxism and uh, the cultural and economic crisis um, in Eastern Europe was, was the big way of explaining things or the challenge against the rabbinic elite. Those are kind of social explanations that have somewhat faded into the background, but they were, but there's a huge literature about that in case people are interested. Um, the other thing that we obviously couldn't do as an academic class is to realize in the physical and tangible sense to what degree Hasidism um, is a social uh, communal phenomenon. Um, how it establishes itself as smaller communes of elites, of groups, what the feel is within these groups, particularly through collective prayer, collective meals, um, song, dance, so Hasidism is very much a hands-on, at least among the men, it's hands-on and very physical, it's very tangible, dancing, um, uh, singing on the Sabbath, uh, the being part uh, of a community and being loyal to a particular Rebbe is extremely important. Um, that type of uh, connection um, of a Rebbe as being the one to whom one turns for personal questions, large and small, and not just as the interpreter of the tradition. And what it means to be part of what the early Hasidic movement referred to as Anshei Shlomenu. That is to say, the sense of being a small group that uh, doesn't have necessarily um, favorable uh, feelings on the outskirts. Anshei Shlomenu is the people in our group, um, you know, the, the people we can trust. Um, and um, so there's obviously, that is very much part of the historical and even contemporary mentality, um, uh, even if that means living this reality in an intense, global, um, technological, uh, secular environment, what that means and the kinds of constraints that it imposes uh, for interpretation as well. So these issues, um, particularly allegiance, commitment, loyalty to the group um, uh, are extremely important. So what did I try to do instead? Because we are learning within the framework of the university, I tried to develop a combination of what I would call in this context a typological and hermeneutical approach. So it's typological in the sense that the various topics that we studied are indicative of the major types of theological and social concerns, um, into, but necess necessarily the enormous range and diversity of practice and belief and custom and ceremony couldn't be uh, covered. But I wanted to use the typological um, the larger topics, and to get at those topics through the hermeneutical lens, because at the interpretive lens. So if Hasidism, of course, is anything, it's the ongoing reinterpretation of scripture and the rabbinic tradition and the Kabbalistic tradition. 
um, in terms of a totally new or transformed vocabulary. It developed every great religious movement has to develop its own theological vocabulary, its own ethical vocabulary, um, its own particular nuances of traditional terms. And that's what constitutes the inner mental structure of people being able to talk shorthand, to talk longhand, by to be able to make illusions in which everybody can pick up on what a phrase would mean, even if they don't know it in the fullest theosophical sense. And we talk about shavira or the break or the lack of connection, but everybody is part of a larger uh, frame of discourse. By focusing on the drasha or the homily, uh, I wanted you to be able to see um, how a movement, how a movement is affected by the revoicing of scripture and the revoicing re of tradition. And that as already from Midrashic times on and Hasid Hasidic homilies are a kind of re-renovation of the Midrashic homily, obviously also built on the renovation that took place in the Zohar as well, for those of you who know anything about um, that um, type of midrashic uh, theological phenomenon. But you begin to see the organic nature of theological ideas. In other words, the, the pedagogy in a midrashic homily or the pedagogy in a Hasidic homily um, is to do two things. It's on the one hand, to turn scripture into a spiritual guidebook, right? Not simply a book of history, not simply a book of certain kinds of references, but as I think I've mentioned many times, they'll often say, well, if the Torah is eternal, what does this have to say about my avoda? What is my avoda Hashem? What does it have to do with the way I serve God? That means that the book is not a historical book or a sociological book, the scripture is now a book that wants to guide you towards religious service. That's at the core of the Hasidic mentality. Avodah Hashem, the Avodah, the service of God, which could take place, of course, through the commandments, particularly through prayer. Even today, Hasidic groups, the men will go, and they could spend three or four hours in the morning in prayer. It's a, it's a major and central feature, even much longer. Um, in earlier Hasidic circles. So all of this is the service of God through ritual acts and prayer and consciousness, right? The, the need to instill a kind of steady state of consciousness uh, was extremely important. So the first thing is to turn one's attention to avoda, the service of God. The second, of course, is to realize that the teachings, the te theological and religious teachings are not presented systematically, they're presented organically. The organicity of the presentation will follow through associations to the verbal semantics of a passage. Most likely it will be this word and this word has an association and then you go to the next word and it links up with something else. But many things can be brought in in the context of the pedagogy. How to act, how to think, what the goals are, what the challenges are. So the notion of organic thinking, which has often been talked about in terms of Midrash, is very much the case of Hasidic material. It's organic theological thinkings and that ideas come in clusters. They don't come as isolated notions and they're not developed in any kind of a systematic fashion. They're developed through a chain of associations and creative links because the person is brought in um, to this in a very uh, intense way. Um, this allowed me as a teacher to try to help you see how the sequence of theological and literary moves work. So therefore, I try to kind of read with you the text and to revoice the voice, 
right? So I was revoicing the voice that was once a voice that became a written word, but that you would be able to experience it at you know, the parts of the class that followed my exposition, because one level was to give you a kind of an overview, a phenomenological overview of certain topics. But that's really to kind of fill in backgrounds because everybody's coming from a different point of view and to phrase that in terms of the history of religion or comparative religious psychology so that you get a feel for that because not everybody's coming with the same vocabulary, the same associations. And then the issue is to try to give you a sense of the rhythm of learning, right? Whenever you're brought into another culture, the rhythm of studying the text is extremely important. Where are the breathing points? Where does a person pause with a study partner to reflect, right? And in terms of presenting the material, um, I would often pause at certain kind of phrases and then give my own riff on what I thought was taking place. And in some cases that riff would use more personal contemporary language and that was the way also to do something paradoxical. That is to say, the paradoxical was to try to make these texts personally and directly instructive to people who may be secular or non-religious or have no Jewish religious association, but that to find something in this material that is engaging as religious literature, right? Uh, and that's a tricky task to do when um, the goal is simply to present the information. There's no attempt to try to make people uh, want to appropriate this material, but to begin to understand it. So my voicing had to go into certain rhythms and then to articulate certain kinds of things where I could bring my own personal voice into play so that you could then see where a person would pause and want to reflect on what is a theological notion that one tries to appropriate here and how does it link up. So I was trying to mirror something that was very traditional, but to do it in secular academic terms, but to use academic terms, which are not simply dry history of religion terms, but terms that could convey a certain pathos in the text. So it's a delicate balancing act um, that I was um, trying to do to, um, to bring you into the rhythm of learning and to the ideas. Because the other paradox of this is that although this is in a university context and everybody is receiving it in different ways, this study is also part of the historical reception of Hasidism in its historical sense. In other words, wherever religious or other kind of texts are studied is part of the history of their Rezeption Geschichte, it's part of their his, historical reception. And usually the reception of great texts is taking place within small enclaves of people who believe this or who want to believe this or are trying to believe this or whatever. But the whole notion of passing on material that may not simply be for only for personal intellectual terms, but for some larger spiritual insight is a very tricky business, but it's also part of the reception history of this text material. It's ongoing transmission to other people who are outside that circle. Now, you have to always remember that this material was never written to be transmitted to the outsider. So we're in the neo-Hasidism or learning it in the university, where all the new vocabulary is trying to help you appropriate it, was never part of that, but now it is. So it creates a new intellectual challenge for the teacher that my voice has to be authentic to the text, authentic to myself as a teacher, but authentic to the university <laughs> context, which is not a religious context. And it can't presume that, but at the same time, these are spiritual texts and you would expect that something of its spiritual challenge 
or content would be um, conveyed. So there, for the teacher, this is, for me, this was an extraordinarily, um, it's always an ethical, the, the pedagogical ethics are always in my mind beside the ethics of conveying the material, but it's all the more so on the Zoom gallery where only um, a, a number of you made contact with me and we talked about some things in a more interpersonal way, but in the large, it's more frontal and it didn't have the quality of back and forth where people are saying what I, you know, say, I feel this, or I think this, or I'm responding to this. And normally in a class, I would want people to interact with each other, which creates a community. And that couldn't happen under these circumstances. I, um, I, I think that it's, I, I think I'm just amazed that uh, everybody's face was so present <laughs> as much as it was, but you can imagine that it's a, it's a challenge. I didn't, you know, I've been teaching for many decades, and this is the first time I've ever had to do something like this. So as weird as it is for you, my whole normal Socratic style of getting people to talk to each other, or to speak through questions, or to give space for people to try to reflect, I couldn't do that under these circumstances. So I wanted to at least um, say that my larger goal is obviously a spiritual pedagogy, but it's within the full ethical realization that this is not a religious context, it's an academic context. Le the language has to be to some degree um, uh, formal um, and comparative and so on. So before we, um, and I think that that accounted for additional gaps perhaps in the transmission of the material in addition to the gaps of the material itself. In some ways I had to fill in the gaps. Um, and if you were studying this material on your own, you have to live within those gaps. I think maybe I'm sure that Joel will pick up on this in his response, but um, the issue of living within the confusing spaces or the ambiguities of words is part of the challenge of dealing with a traditional material, particularly material that is highly condensed. And Jewish material is highly condensed. Reading the Midrash is extraordinarily difficult because it's been highly summarized and put into kind of formal little blocks. Reading the Talmud is even more complicated to know who's speaking and when, and when it's a kind of formal statement and who, what the qu question is. And these are also gathered many years later by people who are structuring an argument, at least in the last, the last generations uh, of certain discussions, uh, they come down as more hyper-technical theoretical discussions. So the same is the true of the Hasidic material, which is gathered by a person who is the, the son or the disciple or someone's gathering the teacher's material, summarizing it, putting it now into Hebrew as opposed to Yiddish. Um, um, and so uh, um, a lot of that um, is um, profoundly concerned to convey what is the living voice that is um, transmitting that material and that at every stage of that transmission of the traditional voice of a tzaddik through a text, and then the transmission through language. And then we're all here in a secular context, no matter what our religious backgrounds, that we're trying to create a second order language that is both fits into religious studies, but that the religious studies maintains the ethics of a public discourse. Okay, so these, um, these last uh, 15, 20 minutes, I think I tried to, for me to tell you what the challenge is to teach this type of religious literature in this kind of a context. So before we have people responding uh, to their, I, I want, the papers are very moving and everybody is different. Um, but before we get to that, um, I, I think I raised a number of issues which I tried to 
you keep at the very personal level of the challenge of a teacher who's conveying material that I'm also very much committed to, but my, ta my task is not to convey my commitment, is to convey the material. And it's to try to find a second order language so that it makes sense, but not necessarily makes sense so that you will be personally moved, but makes sense so you can understand the world of religious ideas, right? So there's a challenge of what does it mean to transmit under these circumstances or for you to appropriate under these circumstances. I'm trying to bring you in to a whole series of moral issues that I would think about or before each class, I would also try to make a little list of things I had to be careful about or how I would provide the sequence of teaching because it's very different than face-to-face -face, um, where we can be a little bit more intimate or a person could reflect their background. I really don't understand this for this reason, or what is going on here. We couldn't get into these kind of short issues, um, except where, as I say, when I was translating, and I would, I would show you where a person who is familiar with the traditional nature of that language would naturally pause, right? And my pause would be an indication where I would then reflect what is the text saying. You can't explain the text in the wrong pause, right? Or else it gets really herky-jerky. So there's a whole uh, ritual to reading and studying together that is uh, important. So what I let's spend at least five or ten minutes, um, uh, if people want to respond to me personally, um, um, where things worked, uh, where um, uh, or the kinds of things that this kind of a setting made you reflect both as a receiver or the challenges of learning it under these circumstances or any other thing before you before we do our personal um, statements. So I'm, I'm going to leave it deliberately open and hopefully uh, even here we can have some people making some, uh, anybody who's had teaching experience or um, anyway, this, yes. Okay, Marcia. So I, I've spoken to you about this before. Um, and now there's probably going to be all these scientific studies coming out that say what Zoom does to your brain. And um, there's a lot of different issues. Some people really can't operate over Zoom. Some people get headaches. Um, my brain starts to melt after about an hour and a half. <laughs> um, some people say that there's an issue because you're staring people straight in the face, which is unnatural. And then, uh, I've many faces. So it's yeah. <laughs> so some people prefer to operate a little off to the side, but then there's some cues that are missed. There's a lot of issues. Right. And I think that I'm graduating, but going forward, if universities are going to have to opt to do this at times, they should, they should have, um, I know that professor and professors prefer a three hour discussion because you can get really into the nitty gritty, but there's too much of a drain uh, that I think that classes will have to be restructured down to say an hour or an hour and a half. Um, I previously did a lot of online learning at Web Yeshiva and classes were never more than an hour. Tops. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't do a lot of that because um, the, all the canonical hours had been set. Right. It was not possible um, uh, from a learning point of view for, to, for anybody to create new options because everybody's schedule was, was very different. It was, uh, and, and, but your point is extremely well taken, but it was also one of the reasons a number of people said to me, um, why don't you try these kind of breakout sessions? But the question under these circumstances, and I'm not sure I would still would do it, that the breakout session is, well, are you gonna, what are you going to study if you are just learning the material? What, what does it mean to have a breakout session under these circumstances, right? Because you always right. have someone who knows something to guide a particular breakout session. So it's, I think you're right that these things are going to have to be rethought if this is going to happen uh, and hopefully um, 
hopefully we'll get back to living, living learning, but um, this is difficult. It is difficult. Um, it's difficult to, um, to channel the material, to reflect and to think on your own. You can't create an inner space in the same way. Um, so, um, but I was very jealous even of the three hours or the two and uh, two, three quarters after with the break. I didn't want to lose that time. Um, so it's, it's hard, but I, 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 uh, I, anybody want to respond to Marsha or respond to anything else that came up? Yes, Steve. Um, I thought there was an amazing benefit to having the lectures recorded because that's not a thing that comes in a normal lecture and it's a wonderful asset because it allows us to revisit what was said in a way that gives us time to think about it in a way that would not be present in a normal lecture. So notwithstanding the difficulties that Marcia articulated, I think the recording is an enormous benefit of this procedure. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. I, uh, I've heard from a couple of people who um, have been able to make use of that, and I probably would myself um, if I had to listen to myself talk this fast. <laughs> but, but, um, and that's also an issue. It's the issue of pacing. It's also seeing people and seeing more directly a teacher, uh, the pacing is extremely important and that's a lot harder to do when I'm looking at this gallery um, uh, in, a, in a certain way. So, but I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Anybody else have any thoughts um, uh, about what it was like to experience me um, in a frontal way or experience something about me in a frontal way? No. Um, because this is material that uh, requires interactive conversation, right? Um, so you have to, and that, and so that it also require the interactiveness requires the patience to listen, and the struggle of a person to try to articulate a theological position around any particular phrase. So you didn't have that too. That would be part of that. And I, I got a lot of these very fine personal hermeneutical statements in the papers and then also at the end um, but some of that i would have definitely have done and um, i think of the people i think that um, that uh, a couple of you have studied with me under other circumstances and know that i i'm a little bit more direct and personal but a person would i would have wanted to know how people are uh, processing some of these ideas in a much more immediate sense. So there's a challenge all around. Anybody else have any thoughts? Anybody of the uh, college students? Yes, yeah, we have an experienced teacher too to respond. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, I just wanted to say I feel grateful that when you um, presented what the response paper should be, it seemed like you really reiterated that we should be responding how the text we're landing personally. And so even though in the context of a Zoom conversation, it was sometimes hard to get there, I felt like in the responses, uh, we were really pointed in that direction. And for me, that was a very helpful process. I appreciate that. I think one of the ways of trying to compensate for this um, setting was um, trying to respond to everybody's paper in, in, in more than a, a two or three words and to try to kind of create at least a response of a conversation so that you would feel that there was something living going on, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, so that was, thank you. So I, I did want that balance between the personal and the struggle with the text, which then means that there's an attempt to appropriate this at some level. Some people were more formal, other people got very personal as they're reading it. Yes, yes. Yeah, I would like to say that I really appreciated um, like the longer responses you gave to us, and like at least to me um, in the email, because like I was able to go through them now when I was doing my final reflection, and it was it was nice to see like your response to some of the questions I had um, on it. And I would I also really appreciated hearing what you had to say about like the what what approaches you didn't take, um, and that made it like more understandable to like to understand like the way that you taught the class. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, anybody else have any thoughts before we um, turn to 
All right, so um, I have almost all, everybody's paper in hand, um, but um, if you choose to read it or you just want to speak a few things, uh, if you didn't send it to me, uh, do send it to me by the after the class is over. I think that maybe only um, maybe only Metal. I think I only didn't get yours yet, but I will. I'm sure. Um, so, uh, but I th so uh, let's. Why don't we? Um, uh, you can either read it or just make some personal comments about about that, about what you chose to zero in on. I uh, I hope that people will feel comfortable to use the I voice that you used in this because I think I like I you know ideally I like some of you to talk to each other. Um, but um, can I ask just one question? Does everybody have the gallery, or do you just have me? Is it mostly me? I'm in gallery. <laughs> I'm in gallery. Hey, most people have the gallery. Okay, I've just been curious whether what what you're see, what in fact seeing because I'm seeing all of you, and I, I don't know whether people just sort of like decide to obliterate the gallery. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done, <laughs> but I don't have that option, right? Um, okay. Uh, where should we start? Um, let's let's start with uh, Stephen. Try to let's everybody try to keep um, your comments to about five minutes. Um, so, and then I'd like to make a response to everybody, and then uh, people can um, respond to each other if you want. Okay? Did you have something, um, Steve? Did you yeah. want? Okay, please. Uh, this course, I'm reading. I think you froze. Did my you... I, uh, Steve, I think you're freezing. I can unmute my. Uh, you're now you're muted. Uh, what about now? Can you hear me? Uh, you, I, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's I'm reading my paper. Okay. Uh, this course has influenced my view of prayer as a means of affirming the paradoxical unity of God's all-encompassing presence within the diversity of creation. The Shema prayer is illustrative of this approach. I have always thought of the Shema as a declaration of my belief in one God with whom I could communicate and appeal through a recitation of our traditional liturgy as amended by my daily concerns and pleas for good health, good fortune, and loving relationships for me and for those I held dear. Prayer also provided me with a sense of belonging to a community of believers with whom I shared a common experience and to some extent a common destiny based on my identity within the community. This remains true today. However, now I see that prayer can be a theological and moral blueprint that takes me beyond my individual concerns. Instead of the self-orientation, the feeling that it's just me and God, prayer can take me to a higher degree of spiritual awareness of the universality and the unity of the deity and away from the limiting self that ignores the universe around me and the commonality of life we all enjoy. Such an attitude towards prayer helps achieve Levinas' vision of seeing God in the face of the other. The unity of the divine in prayer, despite the diversity of creation, reflects the cassettic view of seeing unity in, of God in the face of binary opposites, uh, Gadulot versus Katunot, body versus soul, all versus love. The opening words of the Shema are from Deuteronomy 6, Shema Yisrael Anayohinu Adonai Echad. The Lord, yod heh vav -He, is our God, Elohim, uh, the Lord, yod heh vav -Heh, is one. This verse is considered to encompass the monotheistic essence of Judaism. Kassidic theology asserts that God is the only reality in the world, that material corporeality is illusion, and that we have an obligation to transform our internal spiritual view to the unity of God through awe and love. The reference in the tetragram, yod heh vav -Heh, represents the transcendent God, the God whose divine essence is beyond man's capacity of knowledge but whose love, mercy, and kindness allows his essence to flow to the world. Elo, uh, to the world. Elohim, which emanates from the in, ineffable divine essence of yod heh vav -Heh, represents the aspect of God actually manifest in the material of the world. The, wor the word uh, Elohim in Hebrew is plural. This plurality reflects the diversity in the physical world. The Elohim aspect of God inspires awe of God's infinite majesty and reflected from, the limited, reflected from the limited view of man's perspective. Every aspect of the world around us 
contains both the revealed corporeality and the hidden divine essence embodied in every creation. It is our task to direct our internal spiritual eye to search for the divine in every aspect of our life and in the world surrounding us. These two modalities of the deity, the transcendent and the manifest, are united in one reality reflected in the conclusion of the Shemiro, Shema prayer, yod heh vav -Hey is one. No gap exists between the two aspects of God. They are all part of the ultimate source, and it is our task to adjust our internal spiritual eye to see that there is nothing but the divine in all that we do and experience in the world. The unity of these two aspects is also reflected by the letter Aleph, which appears as the 13th letter of the 25 letters of the Shema. It occurs, this Aleph uh, consists of two Yuds, consisting of a diagonal vav. The top Yud is represented by the first letter of the transcendent ineffable name of God, yud heh and the bottom Yud represents the last letter in Adonai, the name used to represent God within man's earthly consciousness. The two Yuds are joined by the diagonal vav, meaning and in Hebrew, thus the divine and the transcendent God, and the God and the earthly consciousness are united in one letter in the middle of the Shana. The Aleph also appears as the 13th letter of the Shema in the word Elohim, which represents the aspect of God manifest in the material world. 13, as we learn in Meora Nayim on uh, Tzaveh, represents the 13 attributes of God's mercy and compassion revealed in Exodus 34, 6, and the 13 hermeneutical principles for understanding uh, the messages revealed and hidden in the Torah, based on Sifra Vatari of Rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael. Further, as stated in Or Torah on Numbers 10, 2, the Aleph represents God through the first letter of the alphabet, and therefore the oneness of all being. It is this Aleph, when combined with Dom, I think, I think you're beginning to freeze, Steve. So maybe if you can bring it to a close, I think that's I think you're freezing. Okay. Um, the uh, I was saying that the Shema, this Aleph, uh, and the concept of, of God, we have hidden in the Shema uh, the hidden presence of God, God's attributes of mercy and compassion and the means of understanding God's revealed and unrevealed hermeneutic message, as well as divine unity. We have but to use our internal spiritual eye to search for this hidden presence. Now, when I at the on Nila, I'll just briefly give my conclusion here, uh, Professor. Okay, because I think uh, we want to make sure Nila, everybody has time, okay? Sure. Uh, in Nila, at the end of the Yom Kippur service, I stand in front of the congregation with my chauffeur, and the rabbi repeats seven times the element of creation, seven days of creation, Adonai Hu Elohim. Now when I am going to be there, before I blow my chauffeur that gives a sound through the whole entire uh, congregation, I'm going to think of this unity that I hadn't experienced before. I certainly didn't make this world, but I'm grateful beneficiary of the force beyond my ken. And I'm also grateful to this course for opening my internal spiritual eye to the unity. May the divine force remain in us all. Thank you, Steve. This is... Um... Very lovely, uh, uh, and I think just just to pull out a couple of thoughts um, as we as we move around the, the the gallery. I think that this the issue within Hasidic prayer of the balance between the transcendent and the imminent that uh, Steve was referring to um, is crucial, um, and the bonding between the two, right? The bonding between the two that has to be part of consciousness. I, I would also want to stress. Um, that one of the light motifs in Hasidic prayer, um, you were talking about the self, but one of the light motifs is you don't pray for your own personal needs. Uh, it, from the very earliest Hasidic materials, you really have to put your mind from the point of view of the Shekhinah, that is to say, what is the world lacking, not what, just what I'm lacking? What does the world have as fullness? or what is lacking in the world. And it's a form of then beginning that spiritual inner journey of self-transcendence, where you get beyond yourself to think about um, what is lacking in the world, what is the pain in the world, what are the wounds of the world um, uh, as, a, as a crucial um, issue. So I think I wanna thank you for that and, and bringing us in, you're, into your into your into your reflections. Maybe we'll turn to um, Joel. Maybe we'll get a couple of comments, then people can ask each other things. Joel, you had a very long personal response, but uh, maybe you can say uh, something that you had in mind that you can direct it to all of us. Sure. Um, I I won't 
read my entire personal response in this context since as Professor Fishbane cited, it's too long and you would all get bored and I don't want that. Um, but I reflected recently on an experience of being asked to participate in a, um, in a religious ritual, a Jewish ritual over Zoom um, and the general weirdness of participating in ritual in that format. Um, uh, an event that is supposed to be defined by this face-to-face -face, um, unmediated communal presence now being mediated technologically um, and then being asked personally to say something in this context and um, experiencing a moment where I in when I was trying to think of something to say I was struck by uh, I found myself unable to think of what to say I found myself struck silent um, and that caused me to, to go into a longer reflection about silence itself and um, the the value of silence and of the inability to to speak in Hasidic tradition itself um, and, and where we see silence and and the the gaps and ruptures within words um, as being actually part of, of the tradition um, and in particular um, if we think about a text such as the Dibrat Shalomo, um, it explains that because human language exists only in the phenomenal realm um, and, and can be nothing more than a refracted image of a divine plenitude of pure sound, which is beyond uh, human linguistic meaning, um, then um, the, the, that text actually states that the best thing of all is silence. Um, and because human language is no more than a fragmentary alienated mirror image of a divine language that exists beyond all differentiation, the, the text states that it would be better for humans to simply serve God in silence. Um, and that, uh, I, I thought about that when I was reading Professor Fishbane's lovely reflection on hermeneutics in, uh, on um, lovely reflection on hermeneutics and the Hasidic homily in which he states at the end that we are not necessarily driven to overcome the silences and gaps in the text, but there can be value in dwelling within them and accepting the silences of these texts inability to speak to us in an unmediated format. And, and that this wrestling with these gaps and dwelling in these ruptures in the text can in fact provide a lesson in the limitations of human knowledge and, and the constraints around our ability, uh, around our intellectual knowing itself. Um, and then I thought about a few examples in, in some of the Hasidic texts we looked at through this past, um, this past term, which states that if the best thing of all is silence, then um, perhaps if we cannot dwell within pure silence, then um, wordless vocalizable sound might be closer to the pure undifferentiated sound of divine being than our differentiated words of letters are. Um, so for instance, in the Kedushat Levi, um, we see that it states that the sounding of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah is an especially effective way of evoking this divine plenitude beyond differentiation. Um, th this text states that the sound of the shofar as sort of wordless pure sound um, is all inclusive. It's the bounty of God um, without being differentiated into human words. Um, and, and the Orha Mayer states that the shofar evokes a cry without words um, when we've decided to stop calling out in words or language because a pure cry without words can be understood by anyone beyond the constraints of language or intellective understanding. Um, and, and that led me to a reflection on the image of the shofar itself, which can function in Hasidic texts as an image of both this pure cry of inability to to reach God directly, but also as an image of pure receptivity and being taken over and, and um, vocalized by God. And here I was thinking of the Joseph, Joseph Weiss article on Via Passiva in early Hasidism when he cites um, the shofar and, and as an image of human receptivity where just as the shofar produces only sounds by those who blow on it, it can't produce sounds unless it's been taken over. Uh, um, so too does the, the Hasidic master strive for a state in which his voice has been totally taken over and all he does is vocalize sounds 
direct that come directly from God. So it's a pure passivity of speech. Um, and that led me to think about how the shofar can be imaged in Hasidic tech teachings as both an image of, of direct human unification with God, where our sounds come directly from God and we're mere, mere passive agents of divine agency. And it can also be an expression of a, a sort of wordless cry of anguish and pain about the absence of God, um, a, a de desire to reach a God who seems um, at the moment of crying out to be infinitely far away. So the shofar can image both absence and presence at the, in the same image. Um, and, and absence and image, just like silence and speech, are necessarily dialectically related to each other. Um, and those sort of dialectical oppositions become unified in a, uni a unity beyond opposition so that the very same image can be deployed to illustrate both closeness and distance, both presence and absence. And understanding that led me to re return to my experience of being silenced and unable to speak in the context of this religious ritual over Zoom, which felt very weird and technologically mediated. And and to try to understand that silence and that inability to speak as being a way of writing myself back into this tradition, even as I can't fully claim it, that experience of, of silence and of distance is actually one side of the coin of, of presence and unification. So even as I felt very far away from the other people over Zoom, perhaps there's a, a way in which that, that feeling of being far away is in fact the dialectical opposite and therefore an integral part of presence and closeness itself. Thank you, thank you. So I think that this also brings us, um, I think what, uh, what Joel is helping us uh, experience is thinking about the spaces around the text that we're reading as the formation of the breath of the, of the teacher. And the teacher, in a sense, is blowing a, a cry to be heard, to be heard by God, to be heard by the community. Um, and it comes through the various letters of scripture. Um, but um, the, the text itself is that um, emanation uh, of, uh, of sound that uh, I think one of the things that we've been seeing is that these texts don't just start in a verbal atmosphere. They start with a certain spiritual pain, or they start with a spiritual yearning, or they start with a certain uh, problematic. Um, and you have to, to understand the Hasidic uh, drasha or the homily, you have to also begin where it's beginning. W what is the pain? What's the spiritual pain? What is the spiritual longing? And let me just say one other thing of what, um, in, just to kind of use this format to kind of help summarize certain kinds of things. Um, Joel was ref reflecting about how the, how the teachings as we have received them have broken down. And I think in my essay, I use the term shvira or the brokenness. But I think that that is precisely what we experience. We experience both the silence of the words, but where words are, are fragmented and fractured from their coherence, talking to God, talking to another person, making religious sense, right? And a part of the Hasidic task is to move beyond the shvira or the brokenness, the fragmentation, the dislocation, um, to try to create forms um, uh, of, um, uh, of unity, right? Um, the, uh, the other term that the Hasidic Torah so use in terms of Shvira, they talk about Peirud, kind of the separation between levels. Um, and the task of speaking or calling out or giving a drasha is to try to put words into a sequence that they make spiritual sense within the overall awareness that we speak within the world of brokenness, uh, cognitive brokenness, spiritual brokenness, confusion, and so on. So there's um, a much larger hermeneutical um, aspect that we're all facing. So now, um, Marsha, did you want to say a few words? I'm, I'm very much conscious that everybody get a chance to talk. So maybe keep, maybe keep your little uh, eye on at least five minutes so that everybody can, we still have a number of people to talk. So Marsha, you want to? Sure. Um, oh, sure. 
I mean, maybe I'll make a, a gesture when people have about a minute to okay. go. I want to make okay. I want to be sensitive to everybody. Mine's not long. I did um, a personal essay about my spiritual journey with uh, this material, which is uh, during the final semester of my undergraduate degree at Brown, there was a visiting professor who called, who taught a class called Jewish Mysticism, Messianism, and Hasidim. Being a proper Jewish class, we never made it to the back third of the material because we got bogged down in text study. But the general survey of the development of mysticism and Kabbalah gave me an understanding that while these ideas were great, there wasn't a practical application of them through Jewish ritualistic practice. I had just become religious. Um, I used to be conservative, I became orthodox, and I was at my firmest at this point in my life. So I resolved to express the ideas of Kabbalah and unity with God by intensely studying halacha. Uh, the following year, I was spent in Nishmat in Jerusalem learning Gemara and Mishnabura and life cycle customs, just the driest stuff you can imagine, things that you would really argue as to what's spiritual about it, why is it prohibited in the Mishnabura to sweep the floor on Shabbat, and today it's permitted. Um, and apparently this wasn't dry and challenging enough because I had spent the next 10 years going over the Mishnah 40 times. Um, and then I did rabbinical school. Um, over the last 15 years, since I graduated from Brown, I haven't spent much time with mystical or philosophical tracts of any kind in scattered classes or when doing research. I also didn't learn to meditate in Judaism or any other system because I find it fantastically boring. So it's been interesting for me to return to the ideas that were so inspiring to me in 2003 and really nurtured my Jewish practice in all the time since then, no longer newly religious and in love with the Torah lifestyle, even though I am observant, I find myself more cynical about these great scholars, not because I doubt their scholarship or because they weren't that inspiring, but my knowledge that I've been alive very but I have a knowledge that had I been alive during the first generations of Hasidim, I wouldn't have access to any of this material unless I was married to one of them. This entire spiritual revolution was mostly gender exclusive. You really have to scour Hasidic history for learned women, and usually there's someone's wife or daughter. I think my pet Hayamushka, I named my hamster Hayamushka, has been to more Torah lectures by virtue of being in my apartment and she's a hamster. <laughs> it's colored how I've seen the text, whereas the younger me might have ignored that gendered issue. Um, in general, it was refreshing to return to a systematic study of mysticism, but it has not caused me to alter my course in learning. Um, I've also had much less trouble understanding ideas like nothingness and no self uh, not just because I've seen them before in Kabbalistic texts, but because I've studied them intensely in studying Buddhism. The ideas aren't the same. In Judaism, you have a God-centric universe and an element of creation. And then in Buddhism, you have a universe with no beginning and no end and no central creator deity. Um, Keep your eye on but, the time, Masha, about a yes. minute ago. So, I've returned to the text and I'm very grateful to return to the text. And it's been very hard for me to describe, people think I'm not very mystical because I spend all this time with dry halacha texts. But the reason I'm spending time with dry halacha texts is it because it's an expression of the mystical element of uniting with God is in the doing of halacha. Okay. So I think that adds another dimension, people str um, struggling their own personal appropriation. Uh, you bring a lot of baggage. Um, uh, so I think part of the challenge um, is um, to try to look past what Hasidism could have meant to previous generations and what it can say under these circumstances uh, to each person uh, under new circumstances. But we, we all bring our own cognitive um, proclivities um, and uh, I think that that's something that we have to factor in as we're trying to personalize this material. So maybe we'll turn to Yitzchak. 
I also wrote a personal essay. And what I wrote about was the, the balance between being attentive to these texts and also understanding them as a call to action. Um, Marsha, you mentioned uh, a contrast to Buddhism. And to me, I think a contrast that, at least in the settings in which I, in which I studied Buddhism, was that it, it felt like in those settings, um, the equal path, the last step is proper concentration and proper conduct is step uh, four, I think. Whereas the way I understand these texts is that the, the, the proper awareness, the, the, the attaining a certain type of consciousness is really a starting point. And the question is, how do you follow the Torah and behave based on attaining that sense of awareness? So when I think about a text like Enod Milvado, that there's really nothing else in the world but the divine, it's not just about attaining a certain type of awareness, but it's also a call to action. What does it mean to, to live in a world in which everything that you look at, you see the divine? Um, and I thought about it particularly in the context in which we're living in now. Uh, with the protest going on, with the video of a police officer murdering someone. And what does it mean to watch a video like that and to really think Maloha Arts will go? That, that everyone and everything in that video is, is filled with divinity. And I think these texts could really only be understood as a call to action and that to interiorize these texts and to take them seriously, to live these texts, means not just about attaining a certain awareness, but that awareness is really a starting point, and I, I found myself really reflecting on that idea that the awareness is a starting point for a type of action, and that these texts really call us to live a certain way, and um, that's something I'm reflecting on from the course material as a whole. Thank you, thank you. Ed. It's um, uh, both personal, but it it's also brings it brings brings it right down to the ground here because I think. We're all reflecting on this issue of a, of a text that says that that that, that God's um, imminence pervades everything, and then we see such violent perversions of decency and the goodness, and that the 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 um, the energy for life um, uh, taking other life and things like that. So I think that your your personal challenge with this material. Is to see, and I, and I, um, is to read this material as as a challenge, as a programmatic challenge. Uh, you used in your text the Shema, but just the very fact of the Shema itself is here. Attend, be awake, pay attention. So it means that things can be one, but if you're not awake to it. If you're not awake to the dignity of the fragments, right? There's a you you place your eye into a, um, a uh, it, it's um, uh, the self wants to dominate, or the self out of fear wants to dominate, right? Um, uh, there's a um, um, I think maybe it wasn't in this class, but it was in my theology class when I was we talking about Heschel, but I had referred at that point to uh, Hillel Zeitlin, who is one of the uh, founders of neo-Hasidism. Um, he was a very fascinating figure, he went through this kind of a very intense Hasidic background, Hasid, uh, Chabad background. And then he went through this huge uh, nihilistic Nietzsche phase, um, uh, and Dostoevsky and Schopenhauer. Eventually he came back um, to religious life um, and he died actually um, carrying the Zohar that he studied on the march to the gas chambers. So it became a very, but he went through this very complicated um, biography. But the reason I'm mentioning this is that he, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, he wrote a number of essays that became, he, he was one of the first to kind of give this new vocabulary to Hasidism that uh, later became part of the neo-Hasidic world. Um, uh, and um, one of the essays that he wrote was to talk about the notion of the I. And, uh, and this is in relation to what you were talking about, Yitzhak, because he was talking about what do you do what is the, the sense of that ego? And he, and he said that if a person is not in control of their ego, he then quoted the text from the book of Judges, 
um, with the, the, the parable of the, of the briar, where it says, I will, I will dominate, rather than have a sense that the malchut, or the kingship, is the divine kingship. Not one's stance over against as I will rule, but there is a much larger dimension that has to be cultivated. So I think that your point is very beautiful. It turns, I think what it helps to do is it turns the study into a vote of the challenge. This is my spiritual task of what, what has to be, uh, to be done. Not that these texts are giving you the end point. They're telling us um, how, what, they're, they're trying to articulate a state of priorities. At least that's also a way that um, I deal with that because you can't read these texts without feeling where your own gaps are. Right, where your own failures are, your own wandering is. Um, and uh, so the text is also that kind of spiritual call to attention. That's what that Shema is. And I think, and I wrote in my response uh, to you, uh, everybody knows the, the passage from Exodus 24, which is Na'ase Nishma, right? So they, they, we'll do and we'll hear. But the Shema, the Nishma, you have to hear and then you have to do. And I think you brought those two things together in a very beautiful way. Right, um, you have to. The, it's the hearing, the attentiveness, and then the task. Um, so I want to thank you um, for that. Anybody want to pick up or respond to uh, Yitzchak's um, programmatic of learning? Uh, right. Um, it fits, I think, very much into your own task of teaching Jewish ethics and context of like that. So thank you. So now, Justin. Um, uh, which uh, wrote a very, very poignant and papers and maybe say a few words also about your background too, because I think uh, your background is probably the most different from everybody who's coming. Great. Yeah, I, um, so I, I guess uh, I'm coming, um, approaching this course as a sort of lifelong Christian who's uh, considering a, a track to ministry and I uh, was really, uh, attracted to, um, had been introduced to writings of Abraham Joshua Heschel, and so I wanted to learn more about uh, kind of what mysticism meant. And so I think one thing that was, uh, um, I guess, really, uh, really, really like struck me and um, hit me with a great sense of reverence and awe was the the Balshim Tov's uh, understanding of language um, that. Uh, Rachel Elliott uh, quotes from, um, I, I think, in a letter that he writes to uh, his brother-in-law where um, he says that w when you pray or study with every utterance and all that emerges from your mouth, um, you shall intend and unify uh, for each and every letter contains worlds and souls and divinity. Um, and I think... Uh, the, the, the notion of uh, intention was um, something that I, I, re I returned to throughout this quarter of um, the, that, um, the sort of, as you brought up, Yitzhak, the, the, the call to awareness is this call to attention that um, all, all that we do is not isolated and that um, what we speak and uh, our actions have effects that uh, ripple sort of across uh, reality kind of beyond our uh, comprehension. And so I think um, I've been uh, yeah, wrestling a lot with um, sort of what, what does it mean to, uh, um, how do I kind of bring some of these ideas that I've learned this quarter into conversation with um, the, the Christian idiom and uh, what things do I want to explore more about um, mysticism as it's expressed in the Christian tradition and how um, can I, um, I, I think in, another thing that uh, yeah, really struck me deeply was the notion of uh, repair and uh, the image of the wells. And so I think one thing I'll kind of leave with is um, uh, the the notion of in turn uh, of return and intention and how one can sort of uh, draw forth um, that sacred essence whether it be Torah or service how 
that can be drawn forth in human communities. Thank you, thank you. So I, I must, I want to at least say publicly that um, just, Justin's reading of these Hasidic materials was astonishing, every single one. Uh, I couldn't believe that, um, not only that you come from a Christian background, but that you had never read this material. Um, so it's, um, it, it, from, a, from a teacher's point of view, it's, it's a, uh, to see how people can um, find their way into the spiritual center of material, um, even from very different belief systems, but there's a kind of empathic spiritual focus that uh, we can all share as we learn other people's traditions and try to find a new way of thinking about things. So um, um, uh, for me as a teacher to, to read your paper was, was extremely inspiring. Um, uh, and, and, and I found it amazing that uh, uh, I don't think I could, have, I could have myself have read certain Christian materials with the same kind of hermeneutical sensitivity that you express so I, I just want to um, say that for, uh, as, a, as, a, as a great thankfulness uh, appreciate that thank you. yeah thank you yeah. so me yeah. um, okay I I'll just read it okay um, okay. evident in the Hasidic text we've read is that God manifests in an individual's consciousness only once the individual has properly opened himself up to what is divine. This spoke to me because I have found it difficult in these past few months to open myself up and enter a state of connectedness. So few and now so many things are happening all at once and having to process and engage over the computer screen and not in person has led me to wonder at some points why I engage at all. In this reflection, I want to share an experience I had on Shavuot, which did bring back a spiritual sense of connectedness and in which I learned how responsiveness and compassion towards others opens up a space within the self to be sensitive to God. Um, in the Or Torah, a way to cleave to God is through acts of compassion. Through these acts, we create the fabric in which he is robed and in which he comes to manifest in our lives. On the night of Shavuot, as I sat on a friend's porch studying Jewish texts, a man came up to their steps speaking half to himself and half to us. My friends immediately ran into their house to get extra clothes for the man and we talked with him for a long time. The man returned a number of times that night and each time my friends ran inside to get either clothing or something for him to eat. When it started pouring, they provided blankets and invited him to sleep on the front porch as we studied. This Shavuot, I watched my friends weaving this fabric of compassion, learning how these acts are not based, are not based upon sympathy or pity as much as they are based upon a powerful recognition of and response to another and his or her situation. The difficulty I mentioned in the beginning of not being able to enter a state of connectedness did not disappear after that night for me. However, it has provided an example of how to respond to the needs of others by engaging and not turning away. In this class, we learned how the Hasidic movement brought the mystical relationship between man and God into the social and communal sphere by linking doctrines of faith to all aspects of life. This linking helped me find the spiritual significance in what happened on Shavuot and therefore the spiritual significance in how we engage with each other. So I think this, uh a direct um, handoff from Yitzchak, right? Um, right they, that the handoff that the texts, the texts have have a challenge that has to then be internalized, um, brought inside, so that and of course the the challenge of Torah study on Shavuot and also for Chasidut is that you become a living text, you become a living Torah text. And I think that um, I think that's what you were manifesting in this remarkable way. And I um, I think we're all going through this this issue of di disengagement, not feeling connected, and that you the fact that uh, you were able to see the unsaid in a person's broken speech. Um, you know, it's. Uh, uh, and that running inside was not running inside, but running inside to, to care for someone, which is 
um, such an amazing, an amazing thing. Um, so this, um, so I think that, I think what you really were manifesting in the self is that one has to weave the words as an internal fabric. Um, that the language of the text has to be one's inner voice, right? Um, and that's what I think you were doing. So this is, um, I mean, I'm sure that you and your friends probably could have done this uh, quite independently, but it's beautiful to hear you articulate this through this material and that how this has been helping you grow. I, and I must I say to you, but I'd say, I think I mentioned a number of the people that watching the, um, your voices and your reflections on text change over the last 10 weeks and people getting more and more confident about speaking um, and interpreting. It's, it's, it's very beautiful for a teacher to be able to see. Um, um, but it's obviously the same way the masters begin from their own place. You obviously come from a place of great heartedness. And so uh, the, the, I think the text may have just helped you um, a little bit more, but uh, but but thank you for sharing that. That's a, it's really very beautiful to hear. Um, you know, I mean, if there is um, if there's any core issue that actually comes down, certainly from Cordovero in the 16th century, is the issue of ch of chesed, the issue of uh, of kindness, right? Uh, for for the, one of the first works that we have of Kabbalistic ethics called the Toma Devora is to understand the 13 uh, attributes of divine mercy as the true teaching of the, of the, uh, that's coming down from God at all times. Um, and that they're always streaming and they can be blocked. And he actually says something that maybe might bear on this in an interesting way. Uh, and it bears, I think, um, uh, on um, also what you were uh, indicating, you talked about when you're seeing certain kinds of things happening. And it made a big impression to me. And I've always returned back to the Toma Devor, the palm tree of Devor of Deborah. But the, the one thing that he says that bears on what both of you are saying, so he has this Kabbalistic notion that you have the, the Sphero, the 10 Sphero, but then there are there was at a very early stage what was called the spherot above the spherot. That is to say that there's a there's a cluster of spherot above, and they are simply the spherot of chesed and love. And it's that stimulus of love which is flowing down through all of them. So they're all different modalities of love and care. But the reason I mention this um, to you, uh, Mital, and, and picking up on the question that was raised, is that Cordovero makes this amazing statement. Because uh, he because he says he picks up on a notion uh, that goes back to biblical literature, but in Kabbalistic literature that, that only good things come from heaven. But then he says, "But look at all the evil that goes on on the earth and all the dis disruption." And he says, "He said um, he says, the good is always flowing, um, and the good will keep flowing even though people pervert it." Right. So in other words, the same way that, fly, that you can have all kinds of people screw up the ecology of the earth, but the rain keeps coming and the flowers come, that people give birth uh, and have um, sexual relations even after the most horrendous disasters. There's this kind of profound need to continue life and to grow in love. And so he was saying that, you know, the, the, the way he understood the grace, the chesed of God, is that um, it's the capacity to learn how to give, even though the receiver may pervert the gift, that you have to keep on giving. In other words, that gift of, 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 of help and care, and that if that doesn't pervert the gift, the gift can be perverted, but the gift can, can, can still be giving. And I think that's what you were uh, manifesting as part of the answer also to, I think, what Yitzhak is indicating, that the texts are saying that there is um, this, pow this, this power that can change us to, to, to notice things in the world, even if some people take these things and they pervert them and they traduce them and they turn them uh, into the most perverse behaviors. But that doesn't 
mean that the that gift of care um, has to be um, can, should be blocked. And uh, it's it, but it's is I guess the danger in all these cases is to try to make sure that the people who pervert it don't block it up in us. You know, that we keep keep that open heartedness. So thank you for that. So now Timna, you had your thoughts. Sure, yeah. This is also kind of a personal reflection. Please. All right. My first response paper was written during the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic when we were all still trying to get used to a more solitary life indoors. Many of us coping with trying to mourn over Zoom, adjusting to class online and an immense degree of collective anxiety. I wrote about trying to celebrate Passover under these conditions, unsure of the extent to which I was able to adapt our readings and discussions to my life in New York City. Today, we are facing another difficult and related crisis. The protests surrounding police brutality and the murder of George Floyd speak to our society's shortcomings, years of failing the Black people of America. These days, I think about the readings and teachings that we have learned this quarter, trying to use them to balance myself in what seems like the ultimate test. The aspects of Hasidic mysticism that have given me the most valuable lessons are the ideas that there is no true lesser iteration of God's godness in this world. In the way that a parable is a written version of his wisdom, there seems to be a degree of leniency and ease to an otherwise very difficult idea, difficult to grasp idea. If one is able to elevate oneself to a higher spiritual consciousness, whether it be through companionship or through engagement with parabolic interpretation, this is key. There is no clear cut hierarchy, no obvious stepping stones to standing before God. To me, this is refreshing. It allows for some forgiveness and understanding. It acknowledges the power of temptation, allows for a path away from that away from it that is unique to each worshiper. I have tried to absorb this form of forgiveness these days, looking for the small facets of the physical world that, despite their physicality, are not separate from God. It is clear that these ideas cannot simply be taken up or jumped into. I do not mean to say that difficult study or scripture are not essential. I merely feel that many of these ideas allow for a broader, more patient and kinder view of our current world. So I can see you're also struggling. We're all struggling with the same thing, and um, it's it's very very powerful to hear this, you know, I, um, um, from from your voices uh, uh, within the college, within your experience. I mean, it's uh, it's in some ways um, it's not something in a sense that people your age should have been asked to do, to come to these um, uh, issues of reflecting on the limits of goodness and the necessity of fragments of the good um, when you're just beginning to discover life and love, right? Um, um, so uh, to hear uh, people kind of reflecting on this in this deep way and what this, uh, this moment is doing um, is very important for me you know, as a teacher, I, I, I can see it in some cases from my, my sons, my sons, my grandchildren, and I have a granddaughter now who's a senior, going to finish her junior year. So, and I can see what this is doing to people who are forced to think about things that they shouldn't have to be thinking about when they're 15, 16, 17, and 18. Um, it's a very, um, and, but that, uh, that you're, that you're coming to these uh, ma mature places to think about the fragments of patience, right? That, the, that, that doing God's work is to be patient for the small good. Um, these, are, these are things um, that people my age can learn from you. So I appreciate you saying these kinds of things, the, the, the kindness uh, that, um, that we're hearing. I, I, this, and so I think the voice of uh, that's that's rising up from people your age, this great protest, moral protest, spiritual protest, but it's also rising up, not ignoring um, that you have to find the fragments of the sacred. The sacred just doesn't come in one big lump, right? It's um, it's, it's part of a fabric that we have to be challenged to put together fragment by fragment. So appreciate that because it's you people, uh, what you're all saying is, is, is very instructive to me. 
uh, as a teacher and so I, I, I and as a as a father and a grandfather um, you know I you know it, it's painful to see uh, people um, uh, you know my my generation thought about things like the Holocaust when I but it was it was way it was something very distant right um, my father fought in the Second World War and was shot and but you know, you know people who died and but it was it was still it was like overseas or someplace else right and we thought about it in different kinds of ways um let me just shut this up so that was my grandson <laughs> so the um uh but we're fa facing it straightforward and it's interesting too because when I faced this, I was a little bit older than you, but when I was facing this in the 60s after the Vietnam War, um, we saw, we, the, the protests against um, the evil that we saw going on, the napalming and everything, but the climate among my friends in the 60s was a climate of hopefulness, it was a climate of hope. It was an extraordinary climate. The, you know, the flower children going up and, but that doesn't exist now. The climate of hope, um, but I was, you know, several years older than you, but it, when we were protesting the war, levitating the Pentagon and trying to put spells on McNamara. I mean, that was, the, that was a joke, right? It was a joke, but, but it was part of an incredible sense of hope. That generation, um, of um, was a generation that had hope, and uh, I don't. It's that that your generation has to be seeing things in such shadows is very painful. Um, but that's I guess that's the task that you people have to face to to, to you know to want to have lives and have families and have children. Um, but you're starting from a very different place and. So hopefully these kind of texts will give you the, that spiritual courage that, that love can make things happen, even if in small, small little increments and that making friends and that caring for the world and that getting married and having children is something worth doing. Um, so I, I, it's, uh, it's a whole other thing. It's a whole other thing. So I'm very grateful to hear all this. So. I'm glad that this, these materials is, is giving at least the fragment of task. Yeah. But your generation is a, um, I don't know what I, how I would have thought if I was your age at this time. I can only see it in my sons who are trying to convey a certain kind of hopefulness in their children um, um, and, uh, and how my grandkids who are teens are facing this and you're already at another generation you're uh, in the middle of your college or graduate studies and things like that so yes let's turn to you sure sounds good i've studied some hasidic texts in the past not many but i've come across them before what was completely new about this experience was our focus in class on the structure of the text. I had not spent so much time evaluating the format of the teaching, and I very much enjoyed this new experience. It made me understand the Hasidic texts as more logical and less bizarre. The contemplations are abstract, but being able to analyze and comprehend the direction they were going in served to make the source more logical. Still, I often could not fully follow the deep sets of references a single term might suggest. I found our approach to be helpful for my understanding of the text. Professor Fishbane, you reminded us throughout the quarter that these texts are supposed to be a contemplative meditative experience. Generally, I think of meditation as a bodily physical elevation, but these sources give it another dimension. For example, learning about the significance of the letter Aleph and its meaning in Hasidism has made the meditative experience of focusing on Aleph more readily understandable. It provides a way to make meditation both a physical and intellectual pursuit. For me personally, learning about the aspects of Hasidism gave me a new and more profound and intellectual and religious lens on meditation. 
In some of my short papers, I discuss how Hasidicism, how Hasidic texts show a mutuality between man and God desiring each other. While the focus is primarily from the perspective of man connecting to God's contractions, these texts also show how God desires man and wants to find a way to connect to him. I was intrigued and moved to contemplate the man and God relationship as a two way street of mutual desire and a quest for bonding. I found that the Hasidic texts provided a perspective on religion which emphasizes and cherishes multiple styles of engaging in community and God. The Hasidic texts emphasize engaging in Torah study, the multi generational lineage of the Jewish people meditation, aestheticism, worldly pursuits, sensitive and ethical behavior, inwardness, and so much more. I think it shows a great balance in spiritual, physical, intellectual, and communal aspects of Judaism, which other sects of Judaism do not always cherish. I also appreciate how these texts, um, how these different aspects suggest a return to oneself. God, memory, kindness, all exist within the individual, and it is up to each of us to turn inward and access it. Professor Vishayan, I would like to thank you for being very understanding and helpful given the, circum given the circumstances. I feel I missed out from our class not, being, not meeting together in person. I did enjoy our time together studying Hasidic texts online, but I feel that the experience and the nature of the material would have been more engaging and most likely more meaningful for me in person. The Hasidic texts emphasize how the act of learning creates an interpersonal spiritual connection to God. And I think the in-class experience would have helped me create a spiritual bond of learning among us. I agree. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Yes. The, um, uh, so you're picking up also on one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning about teaching from the hermeneutical point of view is that trying to follow the sequence of language, how the sequence of language is trying to develop a sequence of emotional and theological states right? And that the reading of these texts is to try to um, instruct one through the positive or the, 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 the crises gaps that are described in the biblical text, and, but to see it at a person, at a spiritual level. And then, and then uh, but you didn't stay there only that it's a matter of the intellectual learning. You, it comes back to the self. And I think that, um, you didn't use the word dialogue, but there's the two-way street, but the, it's the dialogical that, that, this, um, that, the, that the world is built up and is received, right? There's a giving and receiving aspect um, that's, that's constantly um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, in, in place. Another aspect of that uh, might be this, uh, a recurrent mo motif um, in the Maggid of Mesrich, who constantly says that um, God, God appears in consciousness or in thought according to the nature of your thought. You, know, you have a small-minded thought, God appears in a small-minded, fragmented way. You open your mind or you see things. Um, in other words, there's, uh, there's no, we are, we are chariots or carriers of that kind of consciousness. So that's that two-way street as one grows and thinks in much larger ways. The, the the sense of divine reality also changes. It's not it's it's not static. I think that's one of the things that you were uh, emphasizing, um, uh, and that's uh, certainly something that's extremely um, important to me. And I think that uh, one of the things that bears also on this hermeneutical side that we've been talking about um, is the fact that um, uh, uh, in the world of language. What you put into the language affects that interactive discourse and dialogue. So I think that that's uh, very powerful for us uh, to be hearing from you. So thank you, thank you for that. So Ellie, did you want to, um, we have Ellie and then we have Sam. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was actually, I was thinking about um, my own experiences. So I mean, touching upon many of the themes that many of my peers have discussed, like, there's sort of like a, a few things happening over this course, but whether it was my physical uprootedness calling in from the various locations that I found myself in, and sort of the, um, the sort of at the same time being very uprooted throughout the quarter. And, um, but also sort of my, my struggle with sort of 
studying these texts and trying to be moved by them, but also trying, trying to sort of keep a critical distance to be a good academic. And um, I was also rec and I was reflecting on that and at the same time, um, like as the world seemed to close in, my own personal mind used to, and, the, and mental state closed in. And I was thinking about like, the, the idea of shiftless and our loneliness and, that, and how like we, man can either become a conduit for, God, for God's light or like sort of cut off that connection. And I realized, that, or, or, or I mean, I internally sort of realized that in order to sort of counter the idea of the shiftless, we have to sort of seek some connection among us. And sort of in order to like, um, like to so, sort of rebuild that connection with God, we have to sort of like connect all the dust and really sort of rebuild our connection to the Almighty. And I was thinking about the, the, the story with Nadav and Avi that I sort of wrote about earlier, where like there was a, 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 a heavenly like fire and, a, and really like the, 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 the heavenly flow. And I sort of came to the conclusion in my, in my head that the, the sort of the way I can keep, stay connected despite our geographic distance in this class is through, sort of through a heavenly flow like satellite thing where, where I can keep thinking about how there's internet connections and Wi-Fi everywhere. And sort of that serves as a useful allegory to, to like spiritual connectedness. And I thought about my own personal struggles with like, like I was working on a paper and I was having a panic attack and I said to no one, um, I can't breathe. And, and I, I remember, th and I thought, I thought to myself, that's sort of like a, a way of like connecting with us, like us fellow members of this dust like earth that I'm in my own personal crisis and there are people of color all around the country and their own personal crisis. And I sort of, so, so it's not really coming together here on the, on the paper when I'll send you shortly, it comes across much more eloquently. But the sort of, sort of connecting the ideas of spiritual disparateness and connecting to, connecting to God in our very uprooted way, both physically and nationally. So thank you. Um, the, um, so that, that also goes to the core of what, what we're struggling with in terms of the virus and we're struggling with in terms of this, uh, uh, the technological links um, and the Hasidic material. As I, say, there's, uh, I think people are realizing types of connectedness that they weren't aware of, right? Um, whether it's at the level of health or illness, it's at the level um, um, of indirect responsibility for racism and violence and terror, um, uh, uh, the, this, the sense of what you do with the life flow, um, I think that we're all becoming aware uh, uh, of of the un of this um, of this vast unity of the world that is now coming uh, coming in upon us in a way that that ha that hadn't happened uh, in my memory in in the same way um, that the uh, that the local pockets the local uh, cultural pockets the local histories are now. Uh, really taking a second step be, uh, upon the, the, the sense of ecology, more, the moral climate, the health climate, all these things are, are forcing a new sense of interconnectedness that is um, something that is, will be, have to be part of the ethics and the politics and the theology of the future. Uh, the, it's not like these things were not there, but uh, we're feeling all of this in a concrete way that uh, we, we, we weren't forced to think about it uh, in that way. And, um, so you're absolutely right. So now we turn to, to Sam and um, we'll help bring things to a uh, closure. Maybe I'll make a couple of comments and then we'll bring this, uh, our, our time together to an end. So Sam. Yeah, so I'll just kind of gloss a little bit in my paper and then read the last paragraph verbatim. Um, so I wrote about the, uh, what I took to be fundamental for me in this material, which is the Hasidic uh, emphasis on experience, direct experience, um, a sort of uh, alteration of consciousness. So I said, what has struck me most this quarter is the Hasidic master's relentless emphasis on awareness. 
When the mayor and I am, for example, says that there is none other and there is nothing else, there is no place devoid of God, he is not just making a metaphysical statement, he is speaking to a lived experience. Um, the previous sentences, uh, the one before I just quoted, say, even though God's true nature lies beyond our grasp, once we recognize that God exists, we will surely do all our deeds for the sake of heaven. Thus will know him in all your ways, become a reality as we seek to be united with the one. So I say again here, um, when the mayor and I am says, once we recognize that God exists, um, I don't take him to mean this in a rational knowledge about sense. Rather, it's a knowledge of recognizing that God exists is perceiving at first hand the divine vitality that underlies all reality. Um, I then go on to say that sometimes this emphasis on awareness was even surprising to me in, in how thoroughgoing it was. So in the Mayor and Iam's discussion of the, uh, the patriarchs, um, he credits them as opening up the channels of mind or awareness, teaching all who were to come into the world how to dig within themselves a spring of living waters to cleave to their font, the root of their lives. So I say even here, the deepest layer of Jewish tradition, the Hasidic mind wants to lead us into an expanded consciousness in our own time. The patriarch's experience of holiness, such words seem to suggest, could even be our own. And then finally, um, I try to sort of state this in my own language. I say, if I were to phrase some of these ideas in my own words, I would say that what these Hasidic writers are getting at is a matter of vision. They say, we see poorly and partially. Underneath the surface view of things, which we take to be natural and complete, there is a vaster reality, perhaps a deeper, more significant reality that in fact wants to be seen. Uh, there's a quote that I love from the novel Gilead by Marilyn Robinson that I thought captured this well. She writes, wherever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a little willingness to see. Only who could have the courage to see it? Uh, that last bit about courage seems to me to be important and not always thoroughly articulated in the Hasidic uh, sources. They say, uh, quoting the mayor and I am, in each thing you place before you the being that causes all things to be. But I think that doing so, putting before you being with a capital B in, 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 in each small b being, requires more than a little discomfort. I suspect, uh, as I say in the paper, that it's, it's a rude awakening, um, hard to jolt yourself out of the ordinary ways of seeing uh, that probably requires um, some aspect of, of discomfort, if not pain. Uh, but I, I end by saying, nevertheless, reading these visionary authors has made me want to try a little vision for myself and to try to see beyond the surface of things without erasing the things to the sparks inside them. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that the, uh, a lot of things of what you're saying are they're just two points. Um, one is that you correctly zero in on the experiential core. Uh, all these texts are not simply abstractions. They're concerned with the, with the experiential core and cultivating a spiritual inner eye, right? I think that's, uh, that, um, and, and the texts are trying to help you see in this new way. And I think that's what you're talking about. The other thing that you're uh, referring to is um, you're, you're right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it's reflecting these texts and it's very powerful, this issue um, of spiritual courage um, or some kind of spiritual fortitude, right? Um, it's the other side of naive hope, right? It's, it's, it's how, um, how, to stand, um, how to stand firm. So one of, the, one of the classic places where this is articulated in the Jewish tradition, particularly in the Midrash, uh, and occasionally in Hasidic material, um, is Psalm 92, which is the Sabbath Psalm, right? Lahagid baboker chasidecha ve'amunatcha balilot. Right, so there is chesed in the morning. Sometimes you can see chesed when it's when it's when it's when it's clear, when it's bright, when things break open. The real task of emuna, of um, faithfulness, is in the in the nighttime, when things are obscure, when things are dark, uh, when things are not clear. And maybe it'd be helpful at, at this point, since we're winding down, not simply to understand emuna here in the sense of, um, uh, of, of faith 
uh, in the abstract sense, but emuna, the way uh, Martin Buber articulated it, emuna in that sense is steadfastness, it's firmness, it's the concreteness of commit of commitment balilot in the dark in the dark times in the darkness, right? Not even knowing whether there will be the morning, but that the values um, that one knows through the chesed in the morning, that when, when one has a, mo a fragment of illumination, when you see that something is right and true, however it comes to us from another person, from another text, from an interpretation, when you see when you have a fragment, yes, I can live by that. That's a kind of a spiritual pole star. It's a fragment, like what Timna was saying. It's a, it's a little piece of it. Um, I, I can do that, but then the, that, that darkness, um, uh, covers over, and the question is whether you can be steadfast in these moments, whether you can give the food to the person who comes to the gate, right? Um, uh, you can, uh, that, in other words, that pole star can be uh, the inner star, that inner piece of, of chesed in the evening time, uh, in the dark time. Um, the Buber's understanding um, uh, 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 and he, uh, in his translation, um, uh, the German translation, um, he, he often glosses this with another kind of a term of this emun, uh, this emuna of steadfastness. He uses the German term bewerung, uh, which plays on the varung of truth, which is emuna and emet, but it goes deeper. The bewerung um, uh, is the sense that you, you testify to what you're committed to by your life. Right, your life, the way you live, proves those values true. The values don't get are not abstractly proved true. They're not syllogisms, but the spiritual values are proved true by where you commit yourself on the line to to live them as a living as a living truth. Um, so I think that that is part of the strength um, of of studying these kinds of sources. Certainly for me. Uh, because it's always easy to lose focus. It's always easy to forget what the hierarchy of values are. Um, but so, so sometimes these kind of sources kind of bring you back to what the hierarchy of commitments are and how difficult it is to keep that hierarchy in one's mind or in one's spirit. So uh, let me say that it's... Um, Despite all the difficulties, it's been uh, wonderful over these past weeks to see your, your wonderful faces, um, uh, learning and, uh, and to receive your papers um, and to, uh, to be glad uh, through what you're saying and through what you've written that um, you've learned something and that teaching makes a little bit of a difference. So that's a, a great thankfulness on my part. I wanna thank you and uh, you all have my email. So if you need to uh, contact me, um, just um, a click away. So Thank you so much for continuing with this course, this quarter. Thank you. Thank you. So you all be well and healthy and safe. Uh, and I hope that we'll uh, stay in touch one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.